the biotech venture market is poised for a reset. Huge amounts of money have been flowing to biotech startups, but that trend might be reversing in a pretty big way. So you've probably heard people over the last year or so say that it's going to get harder to raise money for biotech companies or really startups of all kinds. But until recently, that hasn't been the case, at least at the very early stage. But that might be about to change, and 2023 may be the year where all the macro disruption finally starts to impact the early stage seed and venture ecosystems in biotech. So in this video, we'll talk about why this is happening and what companies and investors could do to respond. This video is sponsored by Sage Intact. And before we get into it, we first have to understand how the biotech money machine works. So it all starts when venture capitalists invest into startups. Hopefully those startups will grow and then eventually the VCs make money when they exit, uh, either when companies go public via IPO or when they get acquired by bigger companies. And this money machine has been working pretty well the last few years. So this chart just shows the average return that different venture investors get uh, from investing in biotech. And this shows the cash on cash return. So like if you put in $1 to a series A deal, you're expected to get one and a half to two dollars back and when you take that cash on cash return over the three to five year time period where those returns are being realized that gets you to an irr of 15 or 25 percent that's actually a great return especially when interest rates are zero percent and importantly that return is being generated on a lot of money so there's tens of billions of dollars that are invested into biotech startups every year and getting an average to median return of like a 15 to 25 percent irr on that much money is really good. So the fundamental building block of this whole biotech money machine is the IPO market. So if, let's understand here the biotech IPO machine. Things start off with obviously the series A investment uh, and potentially seed investment as well. And generally these are like in the $50 million range over the last several years. And uh, that $50 million gets you like half of the company for a valuation of $100 million post money. So of those series A companies, something like 40% of them will go on to raise a Series B round. And the rest of them will get acquired, maybe go public before the Series B, or some of them just kind of won't really uh, raise money and will kind of just putter along for a while. Um, but the 40% that do raise a Series B typically sell 30% of the company at a valuation of like 200 million plus. And of those companies, 20% are able to IPO. And then another 20% will raise a Series C or a Series D and then IPO after that but uh, about 20% of companies that raise a B round end up going public and they do so at a valuation around 800 million. And that's not the end of it because these VCs don't sell their stock right away. It certainly takes a couple of years for them to you know, fully exit a position. And if we assume the average IPO is up 100% or so a year after the IPO, then that gets you, so overall, that gets you to a point where these VCs invest at a $100 million valuation and then they exit at an valuation of over a billion or a billion and a half dollars. Now, obviously they get some dilution along the way and not every investment generates that return, but when you average that out across all of the investments, you're gonna get an expected return from IPOs of around 1.5X. So the IPOs aren't the only thing driving returns, there's also M&A, uh, and this chart here just shows you the breakdown of what actually drives the uh, that one and a half to two X cash on cash return for Series A investments. So if you invest sixty million dollars in a Series A deal, you're expected to turn that into over a hundred million, and the lion's share of that really comes from IPO investment or IPOs, um, IPOs after Series A, IPOs after Series B, or IPOs after Series C. So that's great when the IPO machine is working. But when the IPO machine breaks down, that is no, no longer a significant component of the returns. And the IPO machine has broken down over the last year or so. The biotech IPO market is actually down almost 90% from 2021 to 2022. And what that translates to in terms of the expected value of the IPO machine is that what used to be uh, sort of on average one and a half times your money return is now you get 0.1 of the money you invest. So for every dollar you invest in a series A startup, you're only expected to get 10 cents back from IPOs. That means there are not enough IPOs to return all the capital invested in startups. Obviously not a great thing for investors, but 
IPOs aren't the only way to get your money back. If you're a VC, you can also have uh, M&A exits. Unfortunately, that's not a pretty picture either. So we calculated the expected M&A value of startups. Basically, we looked at the percentage of startups that are acquired in a given year and the amount that they're acquired for. And then that gets you like what the expected contribution of M&A is to the return from investing in a startup. And what we calculated is that the value of a, the M&A value of a startup is between 30 and maybe, you know, 75 million or so for companies that have recently gone public. If you compare that to the $210 million valuations that these Series B or later companies are, are valued at, that's not a great picture, right? You're only going to get a very small fraction of your investment back via expected M&A. So if IPOs aren't really a great route to liquidity, if the M&A market isn't returning enough uh, capital to the startup ecosystem, what will companies do? So they really only have one option, which is to stay private and just kind of ride out the market turbulence or stay private until they're able to advance far enough and bring their products far long enough to be a good candidate for an IPO or an M&A event. Unfortunately, staying private has gotten more difficult as well. So there's a big supply demand imbalance right now for startups looking to raise money. So if you go back to 2021, kind of the height of the bull market, there was a lot more supply of Series B capital than there was demand for it. So if you're a Series A company, you wanted to stay private, raise the next round of capital, there was a ton of money available for you compared to the, the number of uh, dollar amounts that were sought by companies. So it was very easy to raise around on, on good terms if you were a reasonably quality company. Now that is flipped in 2022. Um, so there's actually like an $8 billion gap um, in terms of there's $8 billion less supply compared to demand than there was in 2021. So it's much harder to raise private capital um, as, a, as a startup than it was last year. So with all of those negative factors in play, why has the venture market held up so far? Now, some people have said that seed and early ventures protected from broader market troubles because of you know broader technological innovation that's not correlated to macro conditions, and also just the record amount of dry powder that funds have. And all of those do play a part, but I think an important missing piece is this the timing factor. It takes a long time for public market disruption to trickle through to uh, private companies, especially at the seed and the Series A stage. So to understand that better, to kind of understand the sequence by which the dominoes fall in the startup funding market, let's just start from the first domino at the beginning. So back in 2021, when the market was booming, uh, in early 2021, there were some disturbing CPI readings that came through. So this is a consumer price index, 2021. And we saw that in March and April, uh, inflation started to tick above the kind of 2% rate that the Fed, Federal Reserve is shooting for. So anticip investors anticipated the Fed would raise rates in response to this. And as we all know, higher rates ends up decreasing the value of growth stocks like biotech. So the XPA peaked in February of 2021, uh, and then it started to decline as inflation readings continued to come in hotter and hotter and investors inspected, investors expected higher and higher interest rates in the future. So the IPO market soon followed. And that makes sense, right? If investors are dumping biotech stocks, they're not gonna to want to invest in more new biotech stocks uh, via IPOs. So eventually the public market turbulence led to the IPO market falling off a cliff. But importantly, there was like a six month lag from when the XBI peaked in February of 2021 to when the IPO market shut down in August or September of that year. Investors just didn't really know if the interest rate inflation phenomenon was just a blip and it would recover, like transitory inflation, or whether there would be something more serious. So it kind of took six months for people to realize what the situation was, and then ultimately you saw a capitulation in the forms of the IPO market collapsing. The next domino to fall was Series B or crossover investing. So crossover investors typically fund the last private equity round, and then they help companies to go public and invest in the IPO and support the company as a public company. In the last few years, these crossover investors have really focused on like the Series B stage and then try to take companies public after that. So if your business model is to invest in private companies and take them public and the IPO market closes, then the crossover trade doesn't really work anymore. And as we see here, Series B investing did fall off a cliff again with like a six month lag 
while investors sort of digested the change in the markets and, and waited to see um, how permanent or how lasting these uh, disruptions would be. Now, if we layer the Series A market onto this, we can see that it's actually been pretty steady. So there's an increase in activity during COVID, and it's really kind of stayed at that level up until today. Um, however, that domino may be falling as we speak. We saw in 2022, the established biotech VCs sort of took a step back. Some newer VCs stepped into the picture to pick up the slack, but they're not quite as active anymore. And um, there's some early signs that you know the venture market is really kind of entering the beginning stages of the reset. So in the last quarter of 2022, saw the biggest drop in um, investments into venture capital funds since 2009. And Sequoia Capital, arguably the most successful um, venture capital fund ever, actually reduced its fees in recognition of how tough the venture market looked going forward. So what that means for startups is that VCs are choosing which companies to support and which companies are kind of left to their own devices. All these startups need money, the money is dried up, and VCs don't know how they're going to get a return on their new investments uh, when the IPO machine isn't working and there's not enough M&A to absorb all of the new startups. So the response to that has been a flight to quality. So if you're a company, your priorities are preserving your runway and becoming the most compelling investment that you could potentially be uh, in this new reality where um, capital is scarce, but quality companies are priceless. So it's never been more important to kind of manage your money wisely, understand where you're investing your, your, uh, your capital, and making sure that all of that capital is invested towards maximizing the value of your R&D pipeline. And that's what Sage and Tact can help with. They're the number one cloud financial management system that helps biotech and life sciences companies manage their finances and achieve business success. So they help companies automate key but tedious back office processes and better understand their key financial metrics all the way down to like program level R&D spend, which is obviously critical to understand when you're trying to allocate resources towards your most profitable programs. And Sage Intact customers have managed over 2 million projects already on Sage Intact. They're one of the kind of most widespread and well-used tools in the space, and they can support the companies all the way from early stage, private companies, all the way up to and through IPO. So if you are at that stage where you need to get your finances in order um, for public market and the SEC and auditors, Sage Intact has kind of been there, done that. So check out uh, sageintact.com slash biotech. That's Sage Intact with two C's. You can see the, the, the link here today to learn more and uh, to help get a better handle on where your valuable capital is going and how to make sure you're getting the most, uh, most value for, for that, that spend. Back to this t subject of the flight to quality, when cash is scarce, when capital is scarce, um, the best companies tend to attract the most capital. And uh, here we define quality as the likelihood of developing a blockbuster drug that provides a huge amount of clinical benefit to a large number of patients. Now, if you have, a, in other words, a phase two or a three asset with very good clinical data, that is quality. And there are very few companies like that. And Big Pharma has shown they will pay almost anything for assets of that quality. Unfortunately, there's not, enough, there's not much capital for kind of anyone else other than these really high quality companies at the moment. And uh, Toria Partners did a really nice piece of analysis illustrating this pretty clearly. So this kind of just shows if you define quality as a stage of development, so later stage, less risk, higher quality. We can see here that phase three companies have really done very well and then earlier stage companies have not. So these, uh, these gray bars show the enterprise value of companies as of the end of 2021. And then as you move to the right, it shows how the enterprise value has changed um, as you get closer to today's date. And we see that phase three companies have done very well actually, and they've recovered most of or more, uh, they've all of and more of the value um, that they had in December, 2021. So these companies are doing great. The downturn doesn't really affect them, but anyone earlier stage here is, is really having a, di a difficult time with it. Um, there's just not enough capital for, for these companies. Now, if we look at quality from a different spectrum, instead of just clinical stage, if you look at the quality of clinical data, we see the similar, a similar picture emerging where companies with very good clinical data haven't really lost too much overall value. Whereas companies that have anything less than very good have really been hit hard and haven't been able to recover. So that's just two data points that show a flight to quality. And 
why are investors shifting their assets to these very high quality de-risked assets? Well, historically, that's what big pharma pays up for. So we looked at all of the startup M&A uh, in biotech where companies were required for over a billion dollars and all except for one of them were either in phase three, had filed for their NDA or were already commercial. Um, so this just shows that pharma really only pays up for late stage de-risked assets, or at least that's what they've done in the past. Now that may change because a lot of these big M&A deals haven't really panned out super well. So big pharma may not necessarily be sticking to the strategy in the future, but you know, history is the best guide that we have. And it does look like public markets are betting at least now that big pharma is going to continue this trend of paying up very high amounts for late stage G risk assets, and then not really doing the same amount of uh, uh, high, high value acquisitions for anything that's earlier stage. And this is almost like a throwback to the pre biotech boom days. So if any of you read Bruce Booth's blog in like 2008 or nine or 2010, it was really, the story was, there's no IPO market. It's really tough to be a biotech VC. And it's all about these like build to buy things. It's all about M&A. It's all about what is big pharma gonna buy and how do you build those things that they want to buy and do so in a very capital efficient manner. So those themes of capital efficiency and the uh, M&A route and de-risked assets uh, are becoming very, very important and more in vogue today uh, than they have been in over a decade. So if you're a startup, the more you can position yourself as a company developing high quality assets, the more of that scarce capital and attention you'll be able to get. So the closer you can get to first in class, best in class, phase two or phase three data in an indication with significant unmet need where you provided significant clinical benefit, the closer you can get to that, the better chance you'll probably have of raising in today's market. So I hope this was helpful. Check out Sage and Tagged if you're interested in better managing your own capital and finances. And let me know if you have any questions in the comments. Thanks.